Hello, welcome to the chapter nine videos. Uh, chapter nine, we are going to switch things up a bit. Um, we're only gonna cover part of chapter nine. Chapter nine is about bacterial genomes and evolution. So we've learned a bit about the process of DNA replication. We've learned a little bit about genes, how they're expressed. Now we're gonna talk bigger picture and what this means both um, environmentally, ecologically, but also um, in evolution in a healthcare setting, which as we will see is very critical to understand. Um, we're only gonna focus on chapter 9.1, 9.3, and 9.5, and I'm gonna switch the order of them up a bit. So in this chapter, we're going to talk a lot about how genes can move around in genomes, how genomes evolve, particularly in microbes. We have a couple of different processes we'll talk about. We have transformation, transduction, conjugation, and transposition. These are all very important ways of um, shaking up the genome, and that gives us the what we call the raw material for evolution to occur. We need to understand the process of natural selection to understand why this occurs and then we'll talk a little bit about how we classify microbes and um, uh, identify them uh, this classification is called taxonomy that's the science of basically grouping living things um, and the related science of phylogeny with that so before we do this i want to review can you tell me what the definition of a mutation is? Go ahead and pause the video. Think about that for me. So our definition of a mutation is a change in the DNA sequence. That could be as small as a single base changing, or that could be as large as whole chunks of the genome being rearranged. That can happen. Um, there are many different types of mutations. We've only talked about a small number of them. Any change in the DNA sequence is what we call genetic variability or difference. And um, in almost all cases, this is random and occurs at a rather low rate. Um, but this is going to be the fuel for all of the diversity in life that we see. Everything is the result of evolution. Evolution um, is constantly happening out there. Even if you can't see changes, uh, things are evolving. So we're gonna start in chapter 9.3 because we need to talk about this um, process we call natural selection. So there's some related terms to natural selection that will go hand in hand. We have the term fitness and we have this term trait. Um, so we're gonna talk about how fitness of traits uh, depends on the environment and um, how this leads to, in a lot of cases, uh, as we'll see in healthcare, antibiotic resistant pathogens. So first this term fitness. Uh, I think this one often gets misunderstood. Uh, we think of fitness like I'm real fit, I can run real far, I can lift heavy weights, you know, blah, blah, blah. That is not our biological definition of fitness. Uh, fitness is basically uh, the ability to survive and reproduce successfully. In the environment, in nature, every organism um, is out there and it will have a level of fitness. Um, mutations are going to occur that can affect this fitness. Uh, they may impact it positively, they might increase fitness, the ability to survive and reproduce, or they might decrease fitness, so less likely to survive and reproduce. So when we think about bacteria, um, there are different strains of bacteria. They have mutations in what we call traits. Traits are uh, things, the simple term is things you can see, but that's not really correct, right? The ability to break down lactose, that's a trait. The ability to um, 
I don't know, uh, be an aerobic organism. That's a trait. These are all traits and mutations can affect these traits. So say we have an organism that has the ability to ferment lactose, but then there's a mutation and now it can no longer do that. It's lost that trait. That might affect its fitness and in turn, right, that is going to select for or against certain microbes. So we've talked about selection with selective plates, but when we talk about the environment selecting, right, um, certain strains of bacteria that survive and reproduce better f have been selected for. Um, that has to do with the traits that they have and what advantages they give uh, the organism. So this is the basis of natural selection, right? Things that survive and reproduce better are fitter and will be selected for. Um, the environment may change and fitness might change. Uh, so over many generations of evolution, uh, this will lead to def descendants that have um, different traits that are better suited to the environment. Or if this doesn't happen, the organism will go extinct, right? We've seen that countless times in history. Um, the dinosaurs, they went extinct, right? They didn't have the traits that would allow them to survive whatever uh, event caused their extinction. There is still um, some debate over that, whether it was, you know, an asteroid hitting and then that affected global ecology and they just couldn't support these giant organisms and that led to the rise of mammals, yada, 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 right? Um, but at the microbial level, we will see real, super easy to see concrete examples of evolution occurring and how fitness changes. So let's take uh, one of the common kind of examples, right? Here's an example. Um, we have a population of mice. Some of the mice have a mutation that uh, gives them black pigment, whereas other ones have a, a different gene that gives them this yellowish pigment. And they live in this dark, rocky environment. So their natural predator, the hawk, has an easier time spotting the yellow pigmented mice. And they will be selected against. The hawk will probably eat more of the yellow mice because it can see them. They are being selected against. They do not survive and reproduce. Uh, that reproduction is key because in the next generation, more of the black mice, the dark mice, will reproduce and they will produce offspring that have the darker pigment and that will be selected for. So over generations, the population will move towards this darker color. Or if it doesn't, they go extinct, right? Um, so we're only looking at things that haven't gone extinct here. So this is kind of a, an ecology example that I think you can understand quite easily. Luckily, microbes reproduce, divide um, very, very quickly. So we can witness this evolution happening in a very rapid manner. Um, in, in the microbes environment, there will be conditions like temperature, nutrient availability, or perhaps the presence of antibiotics. These all are selective pressures. So uh, selective pressure is something that uh, might drive selection on bacteria. The fittest microbes are the ones that are best able to survive and reproduce and will become dominant in the population. Okay, so... We're gonna talk about an example where our selective pressure is the application of antibiotics. Um, this is kind of where the line blurs, right? This is both natural and artificial selection. Um, uh, it depends on your viewpoint of whether the actions of humans are natural or not. Anyways, that's a, that's a philosophical debate. Okay, let's take a look at an example. Um, say I have a culture tube that has uh, a bunch of microbes in it, right? So all these bacteria are growing in my liquid medium. There's going to be some genetic diversity. Most of the population are these yellow uh, strain, right? They have a certain genotype and they are susceptible to this antibiotic. Uh, that means it'll kill them. There are, however, two individuals in this whole population that have mutations that make them resistant to the antibiotic. So if I apply my selective pressure, this antibiotic, 
if I just apply it, it's going to kill almost all of these susceptible organisms, right? There might be a few that are left, um, but if there are any resistant individuals in there, they are going to have a better time of it. And they will be able to divide and reproduce much better than these orange ones, right? Most of the orange ones got killed. These ones are really struggling, right? They're, they're on death's door, basically. But these red ones, they're fine because they have the uh, mutation that allows them to be resistant. And then they're going to grow and divide. And gradually, over a few generations, the majority of the population is now resistant. That's evolution in action right there. And we will see how this happens in actual cases. Uh, there are certain key human actions that can increase the likelihood of this happening. And there are actions that can decrease that likelihood. Once we have a microbe that is resistant to antibiotics, there's really no going back. We just have to find a new antibiotic, which is not easy. So let's look at a case history here of how this can actually impact lives. So we have Harrison, 73 year old man. He has kidney failure. Uh, so he's admitted to the hospital. He has fever, hypotension, which is low blood pressure. Um, and uh, both of which are symptoms um, and signs of bacteremia, which is a bacterial infection of the blood. So we're gonna take uh, some of his uh, blood and spread it on a plate. This one's a horse blood agar plate because it's a blood infection. We're going to grow it on blood medium. Um, and they find uh, colonies of a pretty standard methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, which is MRSA. Uh, and they uh, confirm this with some other tests. And so this confirms that uh, bacteremia diagnosis, right? We have bacteria that are growing in his blood. We've confirmed that by culturing it. So we wanna try and figure out what's causing this. And in this case, we're gonna go look at this individual's home. They are in kidney failure, so they're undergoing dialysis. And we find that their home dialysis line has been contaminated with MRSA. And because that is a direct line, right, um, into the body, uh, that's how the MRSA got into the bloodstream. So we're very concerned about this due to the age and the seriousness of this. It's a antibiotic resistant strain, and this person is not in good health. So we start IV vancomycin, an antibiotic that targets the cell wall of bacteria. So we go straight to the source, right? We try and put it in directly in there, but the bacteremia does not go away. So that's worrying. We have to go back to the drawing board. We started this right away just to try to do something, right? In the background, they have been testing the bacteria against different antibiotics. And we're going to do this in the lab. So we will see this process in action. They tested and they found that it was partly resistant to vancomycin, which we're giving, so that's why it's not working. Um, it is sensitive to rifampin, which targets RNA polymerase, which we've talked about, um, and ciprofloxin, which targets DNA gyrase, something we didn't talk too much about, but is really critical to DNA structure. Linezolid um, targets protein synthesis. So we have three options to go with that it's sensitive to at this point. So we give him these antibiotics and he's improving, but three weeks later, the bacteremia comes back. Again, they're gonna take a blood draw and culture it. And now the bacteria show resistance to rifampin and ciprofloxin. So that is evolution, right? Unfortunately, the microbe that was sensitive to these uh, antibiotics has evolved resistance. Uh, we go with the linozolid uh, for another six weeks, um, but after we stop that treatment, five days later, bacteremia returns. So then we go back on the drug uh, for another six weeks, do another new blood culture, and we see something interesting. This was the uh, colonies that formed on the horse blood agar uh, before this whole treatment here. After this treatment, 
we see what, uh, what we would call small colonies here. They're much smaller in size. This is indicative of uh, changes that have occurred as the bacteria has evolved. Um, it's not just the antibiotic resistance, it's being stressed in other ways. So it grows smaller um, and does some other different things, but these are all indicative of evolution occurring. We'll see how the treatments work out. The small colony variant uh, is partly resistant to linozolid, so it's developing resistance to our last antibiotic. Um, it is fully resistant to all other antibiotics we have to treat it. Um, we try one last one, trimethoprim. Um, these antibiotics are just given constantly. He has to be on them forever. And unfortunately, it is never able to fully eliminate MRSA from his system. And he eventually dies of this infection. So this is a key point that we're going to talk about in a moment. Um, antibiotics, while great, um, they're our magic bullet, right? Uh, they rely also on your immune system working in a lot of cases. Antibiotics are severe selective pressures. They're going to put a lot of pressure on microbes to evolve resistance. In healthy individuals or normally healthy individuals, that's not a problem because the immune system kicks in and fights off the microbes. The immune system is much more adaptable than our uh, antibiotics are. But in Harrison's case, he was elderly with a weakened immune system. He was unable to fight off the bacteria. So they always stayed there at a low level and the ones that developed resistance then grew back to higher levels. So if we look at this, uh, he goes to the hospital, we do the culture, right? We find MRSA sensitive to several antibiotics. Um, we tried vancomycin. Uh, it didn't really work. Um, so we culture again. We find it's resistant now. So we try RIF, Cipro, and LZD. Um, we try those for three weeks. Again, the infection comes back. We do another culture. Um, we find that it's resistant to now vancomycin, RIF, and Cipro. Uh, so we keep doing the LZD for six weeks. Again, the infection comes back. Now we find that it's evolved partial resistance to this. We keep going. We try other stuff, but nothing works. And ultimately, this ends in death. This is all an example of selection occurring. So we're going to look at what happens uh, in a otherwise healthy individual. And uh, we're going to talk about why it is important to take the proper course of prescribed antibiotics. Um, it is important to not over-prescribe antibiotics, particularly um, for things that are not treatable by antibiotics. So sometimes people go to the doctor uh, when they really don't need to. Um, it's understandable. Uh, you have a child who is sick. You want someone to do something for them. Uh, in a lot of cases, our body is the answer, right? We have an immune system, which we'll talk about in future chapters, that will deal with an infection. Uh, but some parents or, you know, individuals are pushy. They want something. Um, and sometimes doctors give in to that pressure and just prescribe antibiotics, even when they don't know the full cause of what's happening. So things like viral infections, if you have one of those, Antibiotics aren't going to do anything and can actually be detrimental and lead to uh, antibiotic resistant uh, strains of other microbes. So we need to ensure that patients take full courses of their prescribed antibiotics, um, uh, that prescribed being key there. And um, this is really crucial to preventing the spread of antibiotic resistant strains. So. When you get a course of antibiotics, uh, usually it is multi-day and they tell you specifically you need to take the full course of antibiotics. So if it's a three-day course, you need to take these pills for three days. Uh, there are reasons for that, as I will show you. So how it normally works, we're going we're gonna to go with the ideal scenario first. We have our population of microbes. This time, it's infecting someone's body, right? And there are mutants in there. We have resistant bacteria. Okay, so you take your first dose of antibiotics. That knocks the population way down, kills pretty much everything. Sure, these resistant individuals are here and a couple of other stragglers, but your immune system kicks in. 
it starts making antibodies that recognize these microbes. The second day, you take the pills. Okay, why do you do this? Well, let's go back to our previous example. If you took them the first day and stopped taking them, these resistant individuals start growing. Oftentimes, antibiotic resistant uh, bacteria, they're not fully resistant, right? They're still uh, under pressure from the drugs. It makes them grow slower or smaller, like that small colony phenotype. So the second dose on the second day keeps these from growing up. Sure, they don't die, but it keeps them from dividing and reproducing. Our, our immune system, all the while, is ramping up, right? The third day, we're still keeping the population low, but now our immune system is at full tilt, and it is going to kill these remaining individuals and completely eliminate that infection. So after this, we're completely free of the microbes. So the antibiotics killed majority of them, but then it gave time for our immune system to kick in and clear out the rest of the infection. The immune system is so amazing because of its ability to adapt and change as microbes evolve. So these drugs, this full course, is keeping the population level low while giving our body a chance to respond. Like I said, oftentimes this resistance isn't full. They grow slower, they're weakened in some way. So what happens if you don't take your full course of antibiotics, right? You take the first one and you start feeling way better and you go, I'm going to stop taking these pills because I hate taking pills. What happens then? Well, the first day, right, it knocks down the population, but right, we have our resistant individuals. If the immune system is not given time to kick in, these resistant individuals start to grow and divide because the drug level starts to drop off. It starts to get excreted from the body. So the resistant individuals start to grow and grow. And if your immune system doesn't kick in in time, they can grow up to a very high level. This is particularly true of someone with a weakened immune system like Harrison in our example. So now, right, the infection comes back, but this time, it is resistant to the first antibiotics we used, so they're not an option anymore. We can graph this out. Um, we have a uh, bacterial population number on the y-axis and uh, kind of some time points here. So uh, a person is in pain, right? They have an infection and that pain is uh, being caused by the infection. So bacterial numbers are high, they're in pain. They're given antibiotics and they start to feel better. Their pain goes down. So pain is red versus uh, no pain is kind of this yellow. So they, they start to knock down the infection. So the patient stops taking the antibiotics because they're not feeling pain anymore. And the bacterial numbers do drop, but also the amount of antibiotic in the system drops. So what's gonna happen? Well. If their immune system does not fully kick in, the infection is going to start to come back. They're gonna to start to feel pain again, and they're gonna need more antibiotics, but evolution may have occurred. This doesn't always happen, but it is increasingly likely the more times you apply the selective pressure of antibiotics. If instead the patient takes antibiotics, it starts to drop the number, and they keep taking the antibiotics, it will keep the numbers low and allow the immune system to come in and finish off that uh, infection and deal with it. That is given that they have a healthy immune system, right? As we saw in our example with Harrison, uh, that is not always the case. So this is why taking the full course of antibiotics is so important. And indeed, not taking antibiotics when you don't need them is even more important because then we never expose the microbes to that selective pressure, right? So if you don't need to take antibiotics, don't take antibiotics. Yes, you might feel crappy for a while, 
but your immune system will kick in and deal with the infection um, and it will not increase the chance of there being resistance evolving. So overuse of antibiotics and improper use of antibiotics is a very important lesson in evolution for healthcare professionals. All right, so we talked about natural selection, uh, favoring traits that increase survival and reproduction. That's fitness, right? Um, natural selection depends on the environment, what selective pressures are there. Antibiotics are our most common selective pressure in healthcare scenarios um, and can lead to uh, drug resistant microbes evolving depending on how they're used, if they're used improperly. So pathogens are going to evolve specific traits that enable them to take advantage of the host and cause disease. And if that involves resistance to antibiotics, that is something that can and will likely evolve. Okay, that is it for 9.3. We'll talk about some mechanisms of how this evolution can occur in the next section.